I'm Bruce Bugby. I'm the president of Apogee. I started Apogee in my garage a long time ago and I am currently also a professor at right up here at Utah State University for those of you who don't know me. My background is plant physiology and I teach plant physiology. I also teach a course in environmental instrumentation at the university. These are all graduate level classes for students aspiring to get good at what you guys are already good at. Um, and I tell them if you can get good at this people will come because your services will be in great demand. Uh, as a background for my class I always divide that into three things. Part of instrumentation is having some understanding of what we call the physics of signal transduction. And that means how does some sensor out there convert wind into an electrical signal for a, for a data logger? How does it convert temperature, anything, into an electrical signal? And when students have a better understanding of that, they can far better diagnose their systems to uh, understand what's going on. A second part of it is interfacing sensors to data loggers. And Campbell Scientific, every year, very graciously donates a whole set of data loggers for this class. And so they get trained on uh, Campbell's loggers. Uh, interfacing them, stuff like voltage dividers and, and hooking them up. And then the third part is programming the, the data logger. Um, it's been a popular class and, um, and it's too bad people don't teach classes like this more because I think increasingly we see people like, just give me the data. Uh, yeah, right, there's high quality data and there's low quality data and if you don't know the difference you're about to make bad models and a lot of problems. So, I'm going to get to this in a second. I thought I'd start, there's so much stuff we can talk about in a class like this, and I see some really knowledgeable people in the audience, so we can have some exchange, and, and instead of me lecturing, we can have some exchange of uh, information. And obviously, if you teach a whole semester class in this, you, uh, no way you can condense that into, 60 minutes. You just hit some highlights of it. So I, I welcome your comments and questions as we go along in this. Um, one of the things that we get asked a lot at, Cam at Apogee is how do you decide on what new sensors to work on? And usually people say could you make a sensor to measure this? And the answer is always yes. But then our question is, of course, how many would you buy if we made that? And, and well, I would buy one, and both of my buddies would buy one, and you should make that, you know. And what it really comes down to is an estimate of the worldwide size of the market for some new sensor. And sometimes it's an improvement on an old sensor. Um, and how much R&D would it take to make the first one? And both of those are broad guesses. Um, and anybody affiliated with instrument companies goes through the same thing. And you hope that the market will be as big as you hope for and the R&D won't be too much worse than you think. And, um, and off you go into a new project. As companies get bigger, and as Apogee has gotten bigger, we can undertake more ambitious projects. And one of them that you're going to see in the hallway, I'm not necessarily going to talk about it here, one of them is our new weighing precipitation gauge. And we had the great fortune of the Bureau of Land Management came to us and they said, could you make an improved gauge? And I had been working with load cells in my laboratory at the university for lysimeters to, to weigh plants. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? We know how to measure stuff with load cells. Yeah, that was over three years ago. And we're still polishing the product. The R&D for that has been a lot more than we anticipated. But the market is even bigger than we anticipated, too. So that's, that's an emerging cutting edge thing for the 
company. Um, Apogee is, of course, a, primarily a sensor company, and we started out making radiation sensors. Um, th the very first product was called a quantum sensor, which measures photons for photosynthesis, because that's right out of my background. And at the time, this was 20-some years ago, th the only one that was really widely used, whether well, it was Sky Instruments in the UK, uh, and LICOR in the United States. And I think back then, uh, Kip and Zonin might have had one. I can't remember when theirs exactly started. But all of those were quite expensive. And we realized if we could just take a simple photodiode and hook it up to a voltmeter, and we would have an adequate quantum sensor. And in fact, this morning, I went to the antique instrument collection, because we have a, some glass cases down at Apogee now where I've been able to display my antique instruments, which I just love. And as the word has spread, people retire at universities and a couple people have bequeathed their instrument collection to us, so we're getting better antique instruments. It's really fun. This is the first product Apogee ever built. And it says quantum meter. Quantum is a mole of photons and the sensors in the top. And look what it came from, just a low-cost voltmeter. We didn't have big startup costs, and we just took it apart and modified the voltmeter and made this first sensor. Um, and it still works, and it's in the, and it's in the museum now. Uh, but we built it from there. We kept upgrading this and spread out to other, other projects. Um, but because the cost was, it didn't do anything another meter didn't do, it's just that it was cheaper. And that helped a lot of people, uh, and, and we, we started the company to do this. Here's another thing that I grabbed out of the antique instrument collection. This is my first cell phone, the pop-up antenna. And man, we thought this was such a cool technology. You know, that, um, <coughs> that's in the museum now. If you get a chance, it's fun. If you like instruments and you like old instruments, it's fun to go down memory lane and see all these things. I think what I'd like to start with first is just the simplest measurement of temperature and the simplest measurement of air temperature. We got involved with this because one of the big selling products for Apogee is an infrared radiometer to get surface temperatures. And it's one of our more expensive instruments, uh, high-end instrument, really good at getting surface temperatures. But what we always really need to know to determine energy balance in plant canopies and irrigation requirements of crops is the leaf to air temperature difference. Okay, this is environmental science 101. You need leaf temperature, you need air temperature. What we realized was the air temperatures were wrong when they were measured in a standard multi-plate static shield. And they were wrong because the sun shines on the shield, heats it up. If the wind is not blowing fast enough, it reads high. And we, we've always known they read high, but I'll show you some data about how, how big that error can be. It, we, we, the world record for the error of a static shield, we have a, have a station at Peter Sinks. I think I have a slide on Peter Sinks. It's just up in the mountains. It's a big bowl, low, cold air pools in there. And we have measured the second lowest temperature in the continental United States here at Peter Sinks for our, our climate center group. Um, I can show you some data of that in a minute. But there's snow on the ground up there and really cold, so we need precision measurements of temperature to a tenth of a degree C. We also have a static shield up there and, and an apogee aspirated shield. Not long ago, we measured a 13.5 Celsius error in the static shield was 13.5 
Celsius warmer than the acerated shield. The sensors were precise sensors in both. Huge. We're calling that the new world record for the error of a, of a static shield. But we often see one and two degrees C difference. Partly it's when there's snow in the ground, the snow reflects and it bounces up from the bottom and it causes big errors in static shields. But just that simple measurement, wow. That's, that's, we, every, that's the primary measurement, air temperature. And the primary way we measure it, and we have done for a long time, can have much bigger errors than we realize. So let's start with the sensor. What sensor would you use to do measure temperature? Now, we, of course, we thermocouples, uh, but we've primarily relied on PRTs, platinum resistance thermometers, to get accurate measurements of air temperature. And I always, this has been the gold standard for a very long time. But they're expensive and they're bigger. Can, can we get this bigger? Can I, can I slide this back and make it bigger without s screwing everything up? Um, we might be able to, maybe there's a cord, but if we can't, oh yeah, there you go, that helps. Maybe. I could have done that. That'll help a little. What's this thing right here? Um, that, would help to get that helps. That's good. That's good. Now, we, oh, there we go. This this uh, slide. Yeah, thanks. Let's turn those off. There we go. Now we're something we can look at. There's some pretty fine print on this slide. This these slides are from a talk that I gave a few years ago at the American Society of Agronomy had a special symposium on. Um, Emerging instruments, emerging trends in, in weather, and we, we talked about temperature measurements. But this is thermistors versus PRTs. And the, the first point in the measurement of temperature is small is better. And if you've worked with that, man, we have used some very fine wire thermocouples to get accurate measurements of temperature because they stay in equilibrium with the air temperature better. So, okay. There's a human hair. We could put a, therm a thermocouple in here, um, and they get pretty small down around human hairs. As you know, they're super fragile and hard to build and all that. But we can get fine wire thermistors quite small now. That thermistor is used in um, human and animal physiology. You can inject it into living organisms inside of a syringe so to get temperature. Um, so there's that small. Then for reference, there's a 24 gauge thermocouple. Uh, then epoxy bead thermistor, and then a, a pretty standard PRT, and then a thermistor at the bottom inside a ceramic sheath. So huge range of sizes. As we get bigger, they are less, they, they do not stay in thermal equilibrium with the air. And I'm not talking about response time, it's the equilibrium temperature. A big sensor absorbs more solar radiation and it always warms above the air temperature, depending on the radiation and the wind speed. And sometimes we measure radiation and wind and back correct what the real temperature was and pretty soon you have fudge factors in here and you'd like to just have accurate sensors so you don't have to have a lot of fudge factors. But there's a range of sensors. Let's see. I guess I'm pushing the button, right? We didn't know. Uh, small is better. So when we say PRTs, they are absolutely not created equal. If people act like they are. Oh, I have a PRT. Well, what kind of a PRT? These are the five main classes, CBA, one-third din, one-tenth din, and there's a picture up there again. Look at the error specifications for these PRTs. The one-tenth din is a tremendous, that's a wonderful sensor, but it's 15 times as expensive as the Class C, and oftentimes 
people are a little vague about what PRT is in their instrument. They just say it's a PRT, but you, you need to know what kind of a PRT. Big differences in uh, PRTs and accuracy. Now, I'm going to talk about the disadvantages of PRTs. Other than cost, to get good accuracy, here is that epoxy bead thermistor up there that was shown in the first slide. Small, generally smaller than most of the PRTs. There's the accuracy spec. This is a what we call a precision thermistor. This is, by the way, used for the reference temperature in Campbell Scientific data loggers inside the can. And, um, pretty good spec, 0.1 degree C, and the relative cost is about 1x. So if you look at this slide for very long, and it, PRTs are a very cost-effective option for uh, measuring temperatures. I'm sorry, thermistors, provided it's the right thermistor with the right specs. This is a, a more expensive thermistor. Now, historically, when I was in graduate school, people were cycling thermistors. Some of the older faculty that did then, they would buy them and they'd temperature cycle them. What are you doing? I'm stabilizing it. Because after I cycle it enough, I find it stabilizes and then I calibrate the thermistor. Thermistors have come a long way in the past several decades. They're much more stable and they have much better accuracy standards. And there are some papers in the literature with groups like NIST, uh, reference groups, that now are starting to use thermistors as reference standards for temperatures. Um, PRTs are still the expensive PRTs are still the gold standard, but thermistors are much cheaper and getting really close. That's this particular thermistor. I think I make one point right here. Thermistors can be less stable than a PRT. There's a reason to go with a PRT because of long-term stability, but the reason thermistors drift there's two reasons they drift. High temperatures and moisture. High temperatures means higher than 60 degrees C. So it's not, and, and that starts and they, and so the high temperatures are warmer than our environmental temperatures. So it's not really a problem. Moisture is a problem. If they absorb moisture, the resistance changes and they drift. And that can be a killer so the way to get thermistors accurate is to encase them in a waterproof epoxy or glass. And this is in a waterproof epoxy, and I'll show you some data on the stability of this sensor in, in just a minute. So it's possible to make thermistors very stable. For example, Campbell Scientific sells one inside of a stainless steel sheath. I think that's called the SS, I forget the number, but, but inside of stainless steel, it's encased, so it's stable. This particular one is not encased and it's stable because it's epoxy coated. But that's, that's a key consideration with thermistors. Now, consider that all the PRTs are resistance sensors as well, but they're encased in stainless steel to keep moisture away from and keep them stable. So, here's one of the, the next slide shows you a hidden cost of sensors. And the more you work with these, you, you start to get an appreciation for this. How many channels on a data logger does your sensor take up? And now that we have digital sensors and evolving data loggers with digital data loggers, Wow, digital sensors allow you to put a lot of sensors on a smaller data logger. The days in which we had big lots of channels and multiplexers and CR7s, we have a lot more digital sensors. But look at what a thermistor takes up. This is three and 
two, three, and four wire resistance measurements. You can measure resistance with two wires, which is the secondary instrument. This is off the internet. The secondary instrument in this case would be a Campbell's logger. That's two channels. It gets more accurate when you have a third wire for a reference and you have a, a three wire measurement. And to achieve those tenth of a degree C accuracies, you really ought to have a four wire measurement and a four wire thermistor. That's a more expensive thermistor because there's more wires and it takes up four analog channels on the data logger. So thermistors are uh, they're expensive from the standpoint of channels. Now of course you can digitally measure them and send a digital signal too. What I want to show you now is that our data collected over many cycles of accelerated aging tests to see how much drift we could cause in these thermistors because if they, if they drift, that's a big problem. We need to know. So we do accelerated aging, up and down, temperature. We have a tray of water in the bottom of the chamber, so they, they freeze and they get cold and then they are high humidity. So it's a very worst case scenario. And we cycle, cycled them. 90, in this particular data set, 96 cycles minus 20 to plus 60. This is the data. The blue lines are those yellow bead thermistors, and the red line is class A PRTs. Now that's not the highest quality PRTs, but you can see the offsets, and this graph right here shows after we normalize it to the initial temperatures. Those thermistors were more stable than that class A PRT in this test. So it provides evidence that thermistors can be very stable over a long period of time. It's another even more rigorous test, 10 months, 584 cycles. Uh, this is now with high quality PRTs, two replicate PRTs, deviation from the mean. They were both very, very accurate. Here's the data. Um, 12 replicate thermistors. It looks like the other data, but it's in a test. And those thermistors were within, within once we got rid of the offset, they were within 0.05C. So the point is, thermistors can be impressively stable if they're encased properly. So here's an example I talked about Peter Sinks. Example of what we do with Peter Sinks. There's a picture of it. Uh, it's a big basin up in the mountains, and we're sort of, if you don't have to live here very long and you learn this story, 1985, we measured minus 56.3 C at Peter's Sinks. It was the record low temperature for Utah and the second coldest temperature ever recorded in the continental United States. Second, yeah. What was the first? We're still going for that first place. We haven't got it yet. Global warming's not helping us. The coldest temperature ever measured was 60, minus 69.7 at Rogers Pass, Montana, 1954. So look at the difference. We're, we missed it by four tenths of a degree Fahrenheit, the, the record. So we're waiting for it. We just love it if we got a super cold winter and we could get that record. So we got a lot of instruments up there to do this. This is a picture of the station up there with the uh, bottom of the bowl. And there's where we have these two yellow bead thermistors and two replicate high quality PRTs. There, those are inside of that aspirated shield looking up from the bottom. Um, I've got some data in here on the comparison of those, but, and they've been up there for several years now. I've forgotten. Bob, do you remember how long this has been up there? I don't know. It's, I don't know, five or eight years or something like that. So, um, 
just just replicate measurements um, inside an aspirated shield to get and they're and they're both tracking really closely within a tenth of a degree C. So that's the story on measuring temperature. Um, we're big fans of precision thermistors, and in fact, the Apogee aspirated shield has this yellow bead thermistor inside of it for air temperature. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the importance of aspirated shields, because it's one thing to have a good sensor, but we mentioned a minute ago, if you don't have it in the right housing, you're going to have an error from the housing. Andrew Sanford's here. Andrew, you've worked on this stuff your whole life. You got any additional comments of PRTs? Well, I need to say that most meteorological services treat them as a reference. They what? They, they, they treat them as a reference instrument. Yeah, yeah. And we can't break that mold. Yeah, uh, yeah. They really know how to calibrate them, they know how to measure them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good that you offer them when you're a shield now. Yeah. They're still, they still are a reference instrument. I mean, I'm not as, as the reference instrument. Yeah. So, yeah. It's possible to make a bad PRT Yeah. 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 Just be careful if you if you're getting PRTs. This next series of slides is a is a it's a separate talk, and I'm going to close this and open the next talk here. Uh, Let's see. If I was uh, there. This is uh, slides from another um, slides from another talk that we gave it a another professional conference. Um, Mark Blomquist, if you haven't already met him, is, is here and he's the chief scientist at Apogee. In Apogee we don't decide we don't have vice presidents, we have chiefs. We have chief scientist, chief operating officer, and, um, and Ryan Lindsay is a mechanical engineer. Uh, these are slides about the performance of an aspirated shield that Apogee has sold for a while, which also took a lot longer to develop and refine than we thought. Um, but it, it has helped us understand the errors that we are all getting when we use static shields. Because we all use those, they're cheap and um, there's improvements in those, by the way. I mean, some static shields are better than others, but if the sun is shining and the wind's not blowing, they're going to heat up. So this is just a little diagram of wind and solar radiation and what you get with uh, air temperature. So let's take a look. Um, this is Jonathan Wright is with Metspec uh, in, in the UK. And Metspec is a company that's made an improved static shield that we have tested extensively. Barton F is at Campbell Scientific. We deployed these in a lot of cases, collected a lot of data over the years. This is a lot of text, but it basically it says to determine the quantity, the amount of error of uh, static shields, uh, ultimately so we can get accurate leaf to air temperature differences. This is a hot topic. And, and when you think about science, what do we do in science? We do research. And the word research is re-search. We take what we thought we knew and study it again. And boy, do we find a lot of stuff that we thought we knew and we didn't really know it very well. That's all of science. So this is not just us looking at these errors. There's 30 peer-reviewed papers on the errors of static shields over the last 15 years. Um, it's a particularly big now. If we're going to quantify global warming and air temperatures, well, we've got to measure air temperature. And I've said, look, we can solve global warming. Everybody just switch to aspirated shields and the problem will go away. 
because it's going to make the earth appear to be cooling. So these are a couple of comparison shields in this data set. So multi-plate shield, Aram Young has for long made a uh, aspirated shield. We call it the Darth Vader shield because of the way the helmet looks, opens up to get sensors in there. Takes, here's the problem. It's not widely used at all because it is a very power-hungry fan. It's a centrifugal blower. You're not going to run that unless you have massive solar uh, panels. And our stations are places where we have low power. So the Apogee's goal was to make a, an accurate aspirated shield that has also very low power. But these were our, some of the shields we compared it to. Um, and then statics have a humidity probe. Now, back to Peter's sinks. Here's some data. Difference from the active shield. Now that's the active shield's always cooler, but this data is just what you might think. And there's the wind speed. So they don't, after the wind is three to four meters a second, we're down in the errors of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees C, but the errors were much worse over snow. So if you need to make measurements over snow, static shields have particular problems because they're designed to block the radiation coming in from the top. They're not designed to block reflected radiation. So some of those errors get to one, one and a half C. These are multiple measurements over a long period of time, all, all summarized. Now we come back down to the valley. And this is measurements in the backyard at Campbell Scientific. Um, multiple types of shields, a sonic anemometer to get wind speed, uh, multiple replicates. Um, all of them have that small yellow bead thermistor inside the shield, so they're all uh, measuring an accurate temperature. There's the MET-1, um, there's the Apogee, those are uh, MET-SPEC shields, so all the types of shields. I won't go into all the brands, but there, we, there's a lot of stuff on here. Uh, so, this I think this data right here is just the temperature difference of the, of the, this is the variation of just the yellow bead thermistor. And now we get to the data from, I, I, I can't remember, I think we ran this for about a year in the, in the field. And this graph on, let's see, you're right, shows a similar thing that we saw at Peter Sinks, only now, this is not over snow, this was just over grass, but now we compared a small thermistor inside the shield with a humidity probe in the shield. And that's how we all do it, is a humidity probe in that shield. Well, that's thermally massive, so that heats up more than the yellow bead thermistor. And now, even when we got pretty significant wind speeds, we still were down around 0.2 degrees C um, heating from that um, humidity probe. The fact that this line flattens out suggests there's some offset in that humidity probe. It didn't even go to zero by eight or nine meters a second. But the humidity probes confound the problem because they're just big, even if they have an accurate PRT in them. More data. We've done this in the what we call the backyard at Apogee Instruments, a big grassy area where we just, same as Campbell's, are set up to do continuous testing of products, characterize long-term stability of them. This is the, that's a picture taken from the roof of Apogee of this, this line of shields. Um, we were pleased that the Apogee shield slightly outperformed the RM Young shield. Uh, even with a much smaller fan, a, a, almost a tenth of the power for the fan. 
This is solar radiation and heating. And now we're talking differences in tenths of a degree C among types of aspirated shields. So we're, the air is getting small, but we're trying to get down as close as we can to zero. So that's the that's the that's an example of testing that we've done on temperature sensors and aspirated shields. Um, the aspirated shield and the Apogee shield, it has PWM modulation. Running full blast, it takes 80 milliamps. Now remember that RM Young is right around 500 milliamps, so it's a big drop from that. But what we have found is you only need to run the fan full blast if it's no wind and the sun is full. So you can turn the fan down, especially at night, you can turn the fan down. If the wind is blowing, you can turn the fan down. If sun's setting, turn the fan down. So you can optimize power and it's not, we have many stations running that aspirated shield from a relatively small solar panel. Still takes a lot more than the data logger, but it's much less than uh, previous aspirated shields. Um, this, this hasn't really caught on. I mean, Apogee has had steady sales of this, but I still feel like, man, people, if people knew the errors they have, it, there'd be more interest in trying to do aspirated shield measurements. And frankly, I think most people just eliminate it right away because they say, well, I don't have the power to run a fan aspirated shield. I know they're better. But boy, solar panels and batteries, you don't have to be that much bigger to uh, run the aspirated shield. So that's temperature. Um, just sensors and shields, just for getting accurate measurement of temperature. One of the places that aspirated shields have found an application is in temperature monitoring in fruit orchards. Where if, if you know anything about fruit production, they live and die by late spring frost, which can kill the flowers and wipe out their yield for the year. And as the temperatures start to get close to freezing, they start wind machines, they start running water sprinklers to keep, keep their plants from freezing. In Utah, the growers tell me those wind machines cost $10,000 an hour to run. But it's worth it because the value of the crop is greater than the cost of the running their wind machines. $10,000 an hour. Man, if they could delay turning those on for a half an hour, they paid for their measurement system in one night. So they need to know, they don't want to turn them on unless they have to, but when they need them, they got to run them. And they're, how are they measuring temperature? In a static shield. Okay. And they say, well, it's at night. It's not solar loading on the shield, so I don't really have to have an a aspirated shield. I don't have the data in here, but when we did tests in an orchard, these are calm nights. They get radiation frost, so it's calm and there's, and there's not wind to uh, mix the air. The lag time on those static shields was enormous. I mean, the temperature in those was like a half an hour to reach the true air temperature, whereas an aspirated shield is fast response. They got the air temperature right away. So the growers, the fruit growers, are increasingly using aspirated shields, not just to get more accurate temperatures, but to get faster response uh, temperatures at night. We also use them, we have a network in Cache Valley of, uh, we, we have a project here called, uh, can I turn these lights back on, Chris? We're over here. Um, I can probably get them here, hold on, let's see. There, I'm just gonna talk for a minute. Um, we have a project here in Cache Valley called the Atmospheric Mixing Project. It's run through the university and it's, so far, it's been largely funded with the gracious help of the instrument companies. But I don't know how many visits you guys have been here and you probably don't come in January, but we get inversions 
all the time in January, cold air settles and that cold air sits there and it's trapped and all of our emissions stay with us and the air quality deteriorates. So the state of Utah is getting a black eye for low air quality, so they're starting to put more money into this. We are interested in the magnitude of atmospheric mixing during these inversions, because people think, oh, there's no mixing, it's just trapped air. So with these sensors, we have seen large eddies of air. It's cold, cold, and all of a sudden, whoa, the temperature jumps two degrees C as a as warmer air mixes with the air and then it comes back down and you can see these patterns of, of air mixing in the valley and we would only see that with accurate measurements of air temperature with a fast response shield. That's another thing that's been helpful for us. I've given talks about this project, atmospheric mixing, and it's really of interest if you live here and because you want to have good air in the winter. Um, but it's a, it's a fascinating project. We're using carbon dioxide as a tracer gas to look at the, the atmospheric mixing. We're finding some really fascinating stuff. There's more atmospheric mixing than we used to think. Um, and it's uh, all because we've got good instruments out there so we can see it. I told you to interrupt me if you had questions, but you're just listening. So, um, let me ask you, what are some of the instruments that, I, I'm, I don't have comprehensive knowledge on all instruments, but I don't want to talk about instruments that you're not interested in. Let me ask you what things you're most interested in. Yes? We've sold a few in your leaf and bark since it's... Oh, yeah. Yes. I don't have a picture in here, but those were developed Part of my work at the university is funded by the fruit growers. And Utah is not a major agricultural state, but it is a major fruit growing state. I think we're second in the nation for tart cherries, for example. So I don't forget the few hundred million dollars a year of, of fruit sold. And so these guys need to do frost protection. So we made this flat disc that's painted black to get a low cost way to get a surface temperature on a cold night with no wind. And I, th I think we call that the leaf and bud sensor. It has just a thermistor sticking out too. When you run the numbers from energy balance numbers, surface temperatures, we've measured nine degrees C colder than the air temperature at night. Nine Celsius. This is turf temperature now. And one of our climate people, we, we have a station on campus that measures this in real time graphs. And one of my favorite stories is one of our elite climate scientists said, Bruce, something is wrong with your numbers. It says the turf is nine degrees C colder than the air. And so one of my colleagues jumped in. He says, let me give you a lecture on atmospheric physics. That's real data. There's nothing wrong with the sensors. It's cooling to the air. And, not, and so now a fruit grower doesn't really care what the air temperature is. They care what their bud temperature is. And so this is a low cost way to estimate bud temperatures. We often model it to, depending on wind speed and, and uh, well, mostly wind speed and, and, and sky, long wave radiation to the sky. Uh, so that's why we sell that. On that same note, this is something I use in teaching. If you take a box, let me draw this, see if I can draw and talk. Um, I, I, know, I know this analogy works because I've seen my students use it to teach other students, so it's stuck with them. Um, it's on that exact topic, and I've done this. I've got pictures of doing this in my backyard. Here's a big insulated box, all insulated. On the bottom of this, we put a little dish of water. Paint it, paint it black, black saucer with water in it. Now we take this at night, put it outside under a clear sky, 
And let's take July. So it's a good warm July night. The temperature over here is 20 degrees C. But this insulation prevents this from warming up. This can be cellophane over the top or it can just be open, but there's not a lot of wind. Here's the question. What happens to the temperature of the water in that dish on a clear sky night, especially in the mountains here with close to outer space, dry air, very clear sky. So you, you hook this up to your Campbell Scientific day logger with one of those precision thermistors, you drill a tiny little hole, you measure it, and you get the, yeah, I don't know, the CR100,000X over here. You measure that temperature. The water starts to come in equilibrium with the sky temperature because of radiation. This is losing, shown here in red, losing energy by long wave radiation to the sky. And it loses it, and it loses it, and the sky temperature, well, the temperature of outer space is zero Kelvin. Sky is really cold. This can't warm back up because it's got all this insulation, and there's not wind to blow warm air in here. It gets colder and colder, and finally the water freezes. On a warm summer night, you can make water freeze. So when I teach this, I show pictures of me with this setup, sitting there at night with my computer and measuring this. And you can make the water freeze. And then the sun comes up and you cover it and you have a thermally, an environmentally cooled refrigerator. And in fact, in some cases in the tropics with no electricity, you can use this to keep stuff cool. Uh, but it's, it's a powerful example of what radiation can do to surface temperatures and, and why understanding radiation is important to understanding surface temperatures beyond air temperature. We get into this a lot because of our infrared sensor for surface temperatures um, and this in this gradient from leaf to air for, for mostly for agricultural irrigation, uh, predicting transpiration rates of crops. That's a long answer to the leaf and bud sensor, but, but the leaf and bud sensor is a much cheaper sensor than the infrared stuff. So for fruit growers, they can buy it. Where do you sell them? Who, who? In New Zealand, you wouldn't believe it, it's a tea pot. It's a? Tea. Oh, really? And they, and they need to worry about freezing. Like too many heat, and there's a crucial little bit that sprouts. Yeah, good. And they've worked for you. That's good. Uh, yeah, the fruit growers in Utah use them. So. Other measurements that, that you're uh, stuck on? If I don't know about it, I'll tell you. But. We, it, okay, let me move, let me say a few things about humidity. That might be the next most important parameter that we worry about. And this is just now my broad experience over doing this. When I was in graduate school a long time ago, capacitance chip sensors came out, and Visela was the first to do these, and everybody was, wow, you know, because we were really doing the wet bulb psychrometers and Man, all these super labor intensive ways to get humidity and capacitance sensors came out and they were a huge breakthrough, but they were not so stable. They would get contaminated with some other gas um, and they, it, they go haywire. That was 30 years ago. And now we have multiple companies making these. The coatings are much better. The sensors are far more stable, and now that's, we use capacitance humidity sensors all over the place. Uh, both Campbell Scientific and Apogee have started selling capacitance type humidity sensors from a company called EE Electronics. Um, and our tests with those over long term periods of time indicate 
impressive stability of those sensors. So we not only do we get better job knowing leaf and air temperatures, but um, the capacitance humidity sensors have come a long way, and they continue to come a long way. Sensors getting better and uh, cheaper. That's one of the things that drives this whole enterprise's weather measurement is the progress worldwide that we have made in better sensors and better a lot at electronics to measure those sensors. And of course now the new frontier is just getting the data in the cloud and getting it sent by wireless so you can see all the data and better summarize it in real time. Um, my field is agriculture and, and the weather is, is not many disciplines where weather is more important than food production. So um, it, it's been a big thing for agricultural weather. Um, and of course now climate change, effects of climate change continue to drive it. Um, so, but it's fun to see the new developments in uh, sensors every year. Whether we build them and we sell them or somebody else builds them. Now I gotta tell you a story. There's a international show in Europe each year, Met Tech. It's called Meteorological Technology International, MTI. And it's all the major equipment manufacturers getting together and showing their stuff. So it's organized, there's a company that organizes it. And I, Apogee's gone, so is Campbell's for many years in a row. And you get to know the organizers. And, and so they go, wow, we can't believe these instrument people, these meteorologists, you guys are all talking to each other. We do a show that's an automotive show and people put curtains around their booth because they're so confidential about what they're doing. They're just paranoid about their competitors finding out some little secret. And here you guys are just complimenting each other on the new instruments you're building. It's, he says it's night and day different than the automotive people. That makes this field so much fun. It's so science driven and we're competing on good science. Not smoke and mirrors and, and, and things. It's, it's, um, and, and that also pushes people to make better instruments too. Keep going. How about solar radiation? Another key parameter. The classic, if, if I had pictures in here of, you, you know what thermal pile pyranometers look like. They were built by Epley for years and years. When I was in graduate school, it was, whoa, you got an Epley, you know. I haven't visited Epley, but they cannot have much of a science department because they haven't released an improved pyranometer in a very long time. But the shape is still the same, white flying saucer with the glass dome and a, and a black body underneath. So Kippenzonen has been working on this and then right down the street is Huxaflux, both in the same city, both making, competing with each other for the best pyranometers in the world and it's a big market because of solar photovoltaics precisely measuring that. But the instruments are still expensive. So maybe 30 years ago, Lycor came out with a silicon pyranometer, way cheaper. And it's calibrated to sun and you get close to the same accuracy for a fraction of the cost. And I, I think this is used worldwide. So that became a standard on lots of weather stations and many probably 20 years ago Apogee also made a silicon pyranometer and that lower cost than Lycor but the same type of sensor to get solar radiation. Those are fine as long as you have a sunny day in the same conditions that they were calibrated in because they subsample the solar spectrum. And if any time you subsample and predict the whole thing, you're okay as long as your calibration conditions don't change. One of the tests Apogee has done 
is how accurate are those sensors on cloudy days? Clouds, the water vapor absorption bands mean that there's more short wave, what's all short wave, that more shorter wavelength radiation. Those sensors can have up to a 14% error on a cloudy day because of a spectral shift caused by water vapor absorption in the clouds. And this has been really underappreciated. Um, so Apogee started looking at uh, approaches to measure all the wavelengths without having to use the cost of the black body pyranometer that is used by Kippensonen and Huxaflux. And a few years ago, so then we find things and test and test and test. The whole roof is, not the whole roof, but most of the roof at Apogee is covered with test sensors. As always, we built a staircase to go up there to, to um, keep, keep doing tests. Apogee developed a black body pyranometer that's small, it's a, it's a blue color, um, that doesn't subsample the spectrum anymore, measures the whole thing, doesn't have that cloudy day error, um, it's, it's close to the same accuracy as those more expensive, larger black body pyranometers by Kippenzonen and Huxaflux. Um, we've got some on the other side of the door, um, the guys will show them to you. Um, it's sold here by Campbell Scientific. Um, it's another story, but we had a lot of meetings to decide what color that should be. And actually, Campbell's chose the color, but it's a certain blue to be a trademark color of blue. Um, and it's striking. You see, that's a unique blue color. Um, and it says Campbell Scientific on the front, and you turn it around on the back, and it says in, in two point font, it says manufactured by Apogee Instruments. So we make that, and Campbell sells it in the United States. That's a pretty big breakthrough. That sensor is much lower cost, much smaller, digital output um, compared to the uh, Delft, the Netherlands, um, bigger sensors. Um, There's another example of a a continuing march to get more cost-effective measurements, better measurements for lower cost, fast response, all of those things. Radiation has certainly been a core strength of Apogee, starting with quantum sensors and pyranometers. Once Apogee got a black body pyranometer, that led to the development of a net radiometer. And I, they're on the other side of the door, but uh, wow, perfect. Yeah, it's, this is my helper here. Hey, thank you for remembering this. There's a picture. Net radiation is something that's so expensive that we've almost always modeled it instead of try to measure it. So we have some papers in the literature about the errors you get when you try and model it. And the sensors are big. They're, they're not only expensive, but they're heavy. So with this new technology, we could make a much smaller net radiometer. And net radiation means up and down short wave and up and down long wave radiation. So there's four sensors in this. Um, and it, it gives you the full radiation energy balance for a canopy for precision measurements of all kinds of things, um, including irrigation requirements of agricultural crops. So to get reflected radiation, you need to, you can't be subsampling the radiation, you need to measure it all. So these, these went into this sensor. Then you get the sensor and oh, remember those channels on the data logger? You got four sensors, you have four differential channels. Oof, you've used up your whole data logger just to measure net radiation. Here comes SDI 12 output, Modbus output. This has SDI 12 output. And all of those numbers are put into one and sent to the data logger. So, when, and we were able to offer this at a considerably lower cost than the, than the larger ones. And we had lots and lots of test data uh, on this, comparing them to Kippenzonen and Huxaflux um, pyranometers. Um, this is another steady march of, of sensors and coupled with the digital output so it's, it's easier to 
um, interface this with a data logger now. Um, yeah, we're pleased. This is, this is, sometimes you build stuff and it catches on and this is one that did. It, the sales on this have been bigger than we thought they would be, the worldwide sales. Let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Um, yeah, that, that comes from radiation measurement being a core expertise. The long wave radiation is the same thing as our uh, infrared sensors, which are measuring long wave radiation. So the up and down log waves come from our expertise into a long wave. Again, lots of testing. Um, so, yes? With your testing, um, so definitely, you know, they're, they're old, but they seem to be quite well respected by people. They do. Familiar with they do. Watching new stuff. How, how does the uh, FPG sensors compare to? Say that, please. Um, let me start by saying, if, if you get a good reputation, <laughs> if you get a bad reputation, it's hard to change it. If you get a good reputation, hard to change it too. Right. <laughs> Just, yeah. for, for the reasons you say, um, and I mean, in, in fact, my. Do, are my Apleys in the museum, Chris? I think one of them is. I have some in my lab that we don't use them anymore, but but they're in. The, um, there's a couple problems that with Epley's. One is really quite poor cosine response. Um, it's at the low angle light is either undermeasured or overmeasured. And multi, there's multiple papers in the literature on this. And man, if I was in charge of Epley, I'd be going to work on fixing that problem. Um, but to my knowledge, they have not. They have not released new sensors that fix that problem. That causes errors. And this is a competitive market. You're trying to get these numbers to one or two percent a day, and now you got a five percent cosine error at the end of the day. Uh, they've also had issues with uh, temperature. It has to be accurate over a range of temperatures, you know, because all you're trying to do is solar radiation, not temperature. Uh, that's one of the big things. It's a thermal pile device. So um, that's one of the big things that Kippenzonen and Huxaflux have made great progress on, making their measurements more accurate. Um, so I, it depends on who you talk to. I mean, if you're talking to kind of cutting edge meteorologists, Epley's sort of in the dust. Um, and it, but it, it depends you know, how much you've looked at the, the new improvements of sensors. Um, over the years. I haven't, I mean, I always think maybe they'll come out with something new, but to my knowledge, they, they haven't. Okay, so you feel like you've got to beat, clearly. I really do. I, I really do. Um, Is there any situation where it's better, or not really? Oh, man. Maybe if you had some network of Epley's and you wanted to have consistency, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend them for a, for a new network. Um, part of it is driven by the fierce competition between Huxaflux and Kippenzonen. I mean, they're both in Delft in the Netherlands, and I don't know how far apart they, they, they what are they, two or three kilometers apart or something? Uh, what? Three apart. Yeah, yeah, point three kilometers apart. It's like they got binoculars at each other, I guess, and man, they're, and then the, the, one of my favorites is Huxaflux comes out with an ad, the quest for global domination is over, introducing the new Huxaflux, and you know, that's the kind of competition there, and it's pretty fierce. Um, and they both make really good instruments. Um, um, it's, so, but they're, they're high end, so it leaves the door open to come in at an intermediate price point um, all instruments, you know, you draw a graph and you, you get, let's see if I can draw this graph up here. Um, this is going to, this is going to be a really classic instrument graph, but
And a, a graph always looks something like this. And it, you really pay a lot of money to go from here to there. It's, it's, you know, those last few percent to get really expensive. And none of us has an unlimited supply of money. So we're always trying to pick the most cost effective sensors. And you, you go down in here and you get cheap. So depending on what you're doing, there's a zone in there that's, that's a real cost effective midpoint. And, and that's certainly served Apogee well, is identifying that for different markets. If we could build something with this accuracy for this price, it'll be very cost effective. Um, and that's the case with this net radiometers and, and pyranometers, is trying to hit some point in here where we're almost as good at accuracy and half the cost, so that sort of thing. But it, it depends on the application too, which brings up customer support. Man, if you can't educate your customers, you shouldn't be in business. You're not, the, the goal is to help them make better measurements. Teach them the options and don't inappropriately push your own stuff. I mean, I, I would never say that the Apogee Paranometers are better than Kippenzonen and Huxaflux. They're not. But they're close, and here's the test data to show that. The price is easy because you can look that number up, but the performance requires a lot of test data. And even specifications. Oh, God, don't get me started on that. People write these specs. Andrew could tell you this too. Some companies exceed their specs regularly, and frankly, Campbell Scientific is a company that exceeds their specs. I can tell you. A dozen stories where we tested specs, and in every case, the data loggers exceeded the specs. Some companies, oh man, they're absurd. They can't even come close to meeting the specs they publish. This is lesser companies selling all kinds of things, but, but uh, the more a company tests a product, the better they can define the performance and the specs. It takes a long time to get the, the sensor to market when you're spending all that time doing it. But uh, it, it, so the goal is to help customers understand specifications and what's the most appropriate sensor for their market. And really, any company that can educate their customers has got customers for life. They love it that they learn from the people in that company and they will come back. Um, of course, you try to, if you do something wrong, you got to fix it, all those sorts of things, too. How are we doing on time? Yeah, it's too bad there's a door because it would be nice to have the workshop around here. But, but um, I mean, my whole life is teaching, and I have the great honor to teach some really smart graduate students. Some of them are now working at Campbell's. That's, I mean, sorry, can't, well, that's true. Some of them are working at Campbell's and some of them are working at Apogee. And that's one of the things that makes the companies go is access to the talent of the university. Lots of those people, they, they love living here. They don't want to leave. So they turn down higher paying jobs and stay here for work for the companies. Uh, but one of the things I've learned about teaching is you never teach anything when you stand up and give a lecture. All the learning happens when you go outside and apply the, the, the theory that you learned in the classroom. Um, students come back all the time and they say, oh man, I learned more in the first year that I, after I graduated than I did in my four years getting my bachelor's degree. And I go, thank you, we set you up for that. <laughs> all that theory, boom, everything clicked when you, the, the learning happened when they did it. Um, and when they get to ask their own questions and, and drill it in. So that's why we set up lots of time to, to look at the instruments and uh, um, ask questions. Get to know our people that, that do the customer support so when you need help, you know who to ask. I'll be here and I'm, I'm happy to um, interact with you more. I look forward to interacting with you more. Thanks for coming.
Um, I guess we have dinner after the after this too. You guys are from all over the world, eh? So it's a great honor to talk to you. Thanks. <laughs>